Well, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. It's a super exciting topic. And I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes or so discussing whatever happened to Heiko Brach. And I don't mean him as a person, but I mean the Brach hypothesis and the Brach staging and the body-brain axis. So this is the starting point. You know that largely this came from Heiko Brach, the notion of two starting points for Parkinson's disease, one being in the gut and one potentially being in the olfactory system. And that's important because if you look at the Parkinson prodrome, I think most of you are aware that hyposmia is extremely common in the prodrome and so is constipation, implying there's something wrong with those two systems. And what Heiko Brock and his colleagues suggested was that in the earliest phases of the disease, when there is hyposmia, constipation, sleep disorder, depression, bladder, there is primarily involvement of the olfactory bulb and the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagal nerve. And then as the disease progresses, we know this story, more and more brain regions get involved. So what underlies this? And I'm not going to give a lot of data. I'm just going to give it a few, two, three data slides. Uh, something we've learned from animal experiments is that this could be propagation of misfolded proteins. It could be other things too, right? It could be inflammatory responses, etc. And together with Virginia, John, Kelvin, Luke, uh, my postdoc, Norwin Ray, spent about eight years doing this work where we took the classical PFFs, Norwin micro-injected them into one olfactory bulb of mice um, to see if we could mimic what Heiko Brach had shown here in the anterior olfactory nucleus, but in a mouse brain. So the hypothesis was that if you inject these PFFs in the olfactory bulb, they will trigger progressive spread of synuclein pathology. And that would follow neural tracts. And that might be associated with olfactory deficits. So the results showed indeed that one gets progressive involvement of nuclei that are connected to the olfactory bulb. And interestingly, two things I want to emphasize. The involvement is particularly profound ipsilateral to the injection, hardly a surprise. Contralateral side eventually catches up. And the um, amygdala, if you look up there, plays a key early role. It's a sort of important gateway to many other brain regions. I'll come back to that in just two minutes. So there are behavioral deficits as electrophysiological evidence that these neurons or circuits don't work. And uh, we've also done some modeling uh, with Ashish Raj and his student, Chris Metzius, and we saw that they seem to follow pathways according to how strong the pathways are, how many axons there are. And this is what it looks like when we image it um, using an AI deep learning uh, method that Aphoria has developed. And you can clearly see it's primarily asymmetric in the beginning. And as time goes by, it's more bilateral. And then you can also see that it involves several bra brain regions connected to the olfactory bulb. What about the gut? Well, lots of people have done work here. I'm highlighting the fact that Heiko Brach showed early on that there's synuclein aggregates in enteric nerves. And now it's a bit contested. Is it specific to Parkinson's? or Lewy body dementias and so on? Probably not. Might be actually a very common phenomenon that we all have synuclein aggregates as part of some immune inflammatory response that comes and goes during our life. But this is the sort of premise for this whole idea of mimicking synuclein spread from gut to brain. And the paper I'm going to show you, this animal model comes from the Dawson's group. It's Kim et al., the paper in neuron in 2019, I think. So they injected synuclein aggregates, PFFs, in a transgenic mouse, and they demonstrated, indeed, it exacerbates pathology up in the brain. And then they did vagotomy, which is interesting because then there was no exacerbation, implying the vagus nerve is key here. And you probably know the epidemiology suggests an association between lower Parkinson incidence and vagotomy due to peptic ulcer. Epidemiology is never an absolute science. 
but it's very interesting, and it's humans. Finally, what they showed here is, and, and I think this is important for everybody to remember, what we're detecting in all these models is not the injected material. That disappears within a two, three weeks. I know Virginia's nodding because we've had referees say, well, you know, that's the injected material. It disappears. What we're looking at is seeded aggregates that are relying on the endogenous synuclein. So if you take a synuclein knockout mouse, there is no aggregates in the brain. The PFFs themselves disappear. So what is then Haeckel-Brock's hypothesis? Where is it going today? And I will call this Brock Hypothesis 2.0. And it's put forward really by Per Boyhammer and his team in Denmark. He has spent a lot of time saying that there are two types of synucleinopathy. About five years he's been talking about this. One that starts in the peripheral nervous system, one that starts in the central nervous system. And he bases this on some imaging that he's done in not mice, but patients. And he shows here a healthy individual has a normal uh, MIBG scan of the heart and a normal fluoridopa scan. A person with isolated REM sleep behavior disorder, the second panel there, has reduced cardiac innovation, but normal dopamine in the brain. And finally, he shows that a person early in Parkinson's disease has reduced dopamine, no surprise there, but can actually have normal cardiac innovation. So his idea is there are two pathways you can go. If you start as a healthy control, you can either go the peripheral route first, and then you'll become a REM sleep behavior disorder positive because it comes from the peripheral nervous system to the brainstem. Or you can go from the CNS first, and it'll hit the nigra early, give you Parkinson's disease symptoms early, and all of them will eventually end up in the same bucket when we see, you know, 90% of the postmortems look very similar because they have both peripheral nervous system and they have the whole brain involved. And what Per Boyhammer and his uh, then postdoc, Natalie, were showing is that these uh, trafficking of aggregates can go in both directions in peripheral nerves and obviously in the brain. So it gets rather complicated. Here they injected the duodenum and they found aggregates in the heart. The second modification, so Brock 3.0, I, I guess, is where he went one step further in this review pad where he describes in great detail the uh, likelihood that there is a body-first Parkinson's disease and what the caveats are with this model. He, he says it's a conceptual framework. It isn't perfect. And he then also says that the ones who have body first are likely to have more autonomic symptoms. And they're more likely to have REM sleep behavior disorder in the prodrome because it comes from the periphery, hits the brainstem, sleep disorder occurs. So I think it's about 30 to 40% of all Parkinson patients have REM sleep behavior disorder, but they don't all have it in the prodrome. The other thing he says that these individuals are more symmetric, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. Now, the brain-first PD, he emphasizes is uh, three things, that they have slower progression, they're less likely to have cognitive decline, and they're asymmetric. And why is that? Well, his idea is if you start in the brain, there is a stochastic event somewhere, and he would argue that it might be in the amygdala, that's why I highlighted the amygdala. So if it starts in the brain, it might start in the amygdala. And because commissural projections in the brain are outnumbered by those that are within the same hemisphere, he says it's only gradually, slowly going to affect the other side of the substantia nigra and cause bilateral disease. So more asymmetric. And they have slower cognitive decline because it doesn't spread so well to both hemispheres. It takes longer. And they progress more slowly. So that was Brock 3.0. Now, Natalie van der Berger, who was his postdoc, is now an assistant professor. And here comes Brock 4.0. She published this. And Perry is still on the paper, but she's independent now about less than a month ago, actually. And what she has added here is that 
Here they hypothesize for the first time, let me emphasize, for the first time, that disease initiation site, which is what Brockwell talked about and Pai took to the level of brain first, body first, interacts with confirmation of the initial alpha synuclein seed, and they are interdependent determinants of disease. So you can get different types of seeds that can occur in different localities. So this is essentially the same diagram that I just showed you in the uh, Brock 3.0, here's Brock 4.0, but they've added this part here, that the different synuclein conformers will help govern whether if you have a body first Lewy body disease, you end up with Parkinson's or dementia with Lewy bodies or pure autonomic failure because they have a different distribution and we all know that the cellular environment in which the synuclein misfolds plays a role, and Virginia's done really interesting work there, in terms of what type of aggregate one gets. So we can already sense this is very complicated. Disease can start in the periphery, it can start centrally. The type of cell that the misfolding takes place in will govern the type of aggregate. That will also decide how it spreads. And finally, there's one elephant in the room. What about MSA? I haven't even mentioned MSA. And we know that the MSA fibrils have a very specific feature. They're very aggressive. The disease is very aggressive. And we also know that in MSA, in the prodrome, which is much shorter, it's not 20 years, it's maybe five, eight years or so, in the prodrome, there is a lot of urogenital involvement. So you have incontinence, impotence, sexual dysfunctions of other kinds. So what does that mean? Is that different then to the Parkinson's body first? So we're talking about a body first with MSA here. And this is work that's under revision now by Vita Pierlitz, who was a postdoc in my lab when I was at the Van Andel Institute. And what we did is we got some MSA fibrils from Magda Ivanova at U of M. We injected them into urinary bladders of mice. Boom. It propagated up a long spinal cord to a brainstem. He then induced, he did a lot of things, I'm just giving you the highlights. He induced urinary tract infections with uropathogenic E. coli, and we got an upregulation of synuclein in the bladder wall and also some insoluble synuclein. We actually saw that this was in and around neutrophil leukocytes. And then Judith Friedman says, this is fascinating. Thank you, Judith. And then we saw CNS pathology up in the brainstem several months later. And I didn't mention, as we were revising this manuscript, we reached out to a Danish group of epidemiologists, Marie Willemsen, Thomas Brudek, and they went into the Danish registry, which is really good, picked out the MSA patients they could find between 2016 and 18, and the MSA patients were three times more likely to have had a registered urinary tract infection in the year eight years to minus two years preceding diagnosis. We removed the two years closest to diagnosis because we think, or we know, MSA patients get autonomic failure in the urinary tract, and that could predispose to infections. But here we're talking two years prior up to eight years back. And it, it's even significant when we look at the five to eight year window, three times more likely to have had a UTI. So I hope I have stimulated you to think that periphery is important. I didn't answer any of the great questions that Malou posed, uh, you know, what starts it. But I think with Avi's talk, you can imagine I'm very interested in the idea that the initial trigger is either a bacterial or viral infection, which will be more likely in a person with a poor regulation of inflammatory immune responses who's aged. With that, I want to say thank you for listening. Hey, Patrick. Yeah. Question here. Actually, two questions. Um, I'm just going to pick on a couple of sentences that I've heard not so long ago from two different investigators, um, just to put us, you know, thinking and sort of reflecting um, the importance of all of this data in the context of the human disease. 
The first one is from Tom Beach, and I remember not so long ago he's saying, I never, like, I never found or never examined an autopsied body where I would find synuclein aggregates in the gut without also seeing them in the brain. So what does that mean for the gut first uh, so hypothesis? And the other one. Great question. Yeah, take a second question, please. Okay, and the second question I think was Kelvin Luke that said, I don't know if he actually did this experiment, but uh, he shared one time that in, in the mice you can inject aggregates in the toe, it will migrate to the brain. Like doesn't matter where you <laughs> inject these, the, these uh, PFFs, they will always reach the brain. So what does that tell you in terms of the clinical relevance of, of these models and, and um, propagation hypotheses? So uh, I think you can develop a sinuclinopathy even from skin-related insults. So I think that's actually very relevant. I don't know if Kelvin, did he ever inject a toe? I don't remember. No? So, so I think uh, that just tells us that that's also of interest. Now, with regard to the first question, uh, Pa spends a page and a bit here discussing the um, Tom Beach study. And it's in this review somewhere. But bottom line is he says that, you know, as, as much as he respects the Tom Beach, he has controversies and criticism. So he's very open about this. I mean, but he says that they only sampled considerably, oh, you can't see this. They sampled considerably less than 1%. Let's see if I can, of the whole gut. So the likelihood of actually seeing something is probably not that high. So this is his paper here. Um, and I think they only used one antibody, touche, Hilla. So they considerably less than 1% of the gut was sampled, according to his calculations. There were just a couple of 80 micron thick sections. I'm just saying what Pear is saying. It's great having to defend a hypothesis that isn't mine, because I don't have to be emotional about it, but this is what he says. So 600 whole body autopsies have been performed in the Arizona consortium. There was not a single case of gut only synuclein aggregates. And, and you can all read that whole story in the wonderful journal of Parkinson's disease. <laughs> right, Malou? Right. The wonderful journal of Parkinson's disease. Yeah, um, the body first hypothesis was, of course, uh, incredibly studied in excruciating detail in prions uh, because there things are obvious. I mean, if you are a cannibal and you eat brain, uh, you will get a prion disease, uh, mad cow disease, and so, so there. The, and also there is lots of experiments on scarification of the skin. And, uh, and uh, I probably spent 15 years on this. And, uh, the, but, uh, but I think that there, there were a lot of lessons that uh, may or may not apply to um, other uh, um, aggregation proteinopathies. And uh, uh, clearly, in the case of prions, it became uh, obvious that uh, certain components of the immune system are crucial to this transfer from uh, periphery to the brain. For example, uh, mice that lack B lymphocytes will not uh, uh, are resistant to peripheral infection, and uh, the, there are follicular dendritic cells that uh, work as uh, amplifiers of, um, of uh, uh, prion infectivity in the periphery. So. Uh, I, and uh, some uh, experiments have been done by Matthias Jucker with a beta, uh, sim uh, uh, also similar, uh, trying to work out what are the uh, the, the preconditions uh, for uh, transmission of uh, A-beta aggregates from periphery to brain. But, uh, uh, but I think that, uh, I mean, this is all old literature. It was all done 20 years ago. And so, and, uh, the, but uh, the, what uh, you are saying uh, inspires me to um, ask the question whether some of these mechanisms may be operative also in the case of synuclinopathies. So you're saying that uh, immune cells, the traffic to the brain, could carry a cargo of aggregates, for example? Well, uh, I mean, certainly the, uh, uh, the, there is a neuroimmune interface in the periphery that, uh, in the case of prions, I mean, for example, I mean, something that uh, we also done, did many years ago was uh, to hyper-innervate lymphoid organs uh, by 
expressing transgenically nerve growth factor and therefore having, a, mm -hmm. which essentially increases the sympathetic innervation of, um, of lymph nodes and uh, spleen, and this vastly accelerates uh, prion disease. And conversely, uh, treating mice with 6-hydroxydopamine, which kills the sympathetic nerve fibers, essentially blocks uh, this neuro, uh, neuroimmune uh, um, uh, transfer. So, uh, so these are uh, things that may be perhaps worth exploring. Totally agree. I think uh, for one reason or another, historical, I think the Parkinson's field has not looked very much at the peripheral immune system when it comes to synuclein. Uh, There's work done by Malu's former student, right? Jung Hei Lee. Ashley Hans. Hmm? Ashley Hans, but also Jung Hei Lee. You're looking at NK cells and T cells. Mm -hmm. So there are a few papers. I had a postdoc also looked at um, T lymphocytes oh. when they traffic into the brain. That's the one. Was she your postdoc, maybe? She's my postdoc. Yeah. Malou's had so many staff that uh, when I said Lee, it could be one of seven different Lee. <laughs> just one final comment. Yeah. Just comment is you know just to highlight the gap. We know very little about what peripheral synuclein pathology looks like in terms of aggregated state of synuclein because it's all based on PS129. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. don't know to what extent it actually mirrors the pathology in the brain, right? So I think there is, we need to do more to. And maybe we shouldn't even call it pathology because that aggregated states and post-translation modifications of synuclein in the periphery might be incredibly important for our immune and inflammatory responses that are normal. They're responding to something abnormal, but they're normal. Thank you for a really stimulating talk.